Welcome to this new Calyx webinar. I'm Renato Cavalcanti, principal engineer at Lightband, and today I'll talk about choreography sagas. So there are two types of sagas, choreography and orchestration sagas. Today I will only cover choreography sagas. In an upcoming webinar, I will talk about orchestration sagas. But in both cases, it's about implementing a long-running process in distributed system. We are talking about a process that spans over more than one transaction. When we think about Calyx entities, they live in their own transaction boundary. You cannot mutate two entities at the same time. You mutate first one and then you have to move to the second one. And they live isolated in their own transaction boundary. Now, when we are building choreography, the abstractions that we have in, in Calyx to allow us to build a choreography are the entities on one side, your strict, strict consistent domain model and the other side you can use subscriptions those are actions that you add a subscription annotation telling calyx that you want to receive the events if you are subscribing to an event source entity you want to receive the events from your entity that action in that method or you want to receive state changes from a value entity so in both cases you can use an action you add a subscription and tell Calyx, I want to receive updates, or we can say you want to, to receive in your action the facts that happened in your application. And you want to do that because you want to connect, you want to react to the facts and connect, let, let the facts flow through your system and mutate other entities. So you can imagine that you modify one entity at, at a place and then you listen to the events from this entity, for example. And when you see some, um, when an event is delivered to your action, you then can send a command to another entity. As such, you can connect them and make sure that when one mutates, the other will be mutated as well. They are mutated in different transactions, but it's guaranteed because of the subscription that this fact will traverse your system. So in a nutshell, we can say that choreography sag is about building the pipes that will allow facts to traverse your application. Let's see a more graphical example. Imagine that here we have a Calyx service and I have three nodes uh, in production and I have three kinds of entities that are spread over my nodes. I have the A type, depicted here with a yellow circle and I have the B type it's yet another kind of entity that I have uh, and the C1 so in my business I need to react whenever something happens to A I need to to listen to that and generate some comments that will hit entities of type B so for example something happens in A1 then I'm listening to those uh, events and I will then generate a command that I will send to B1 and something happens in B1 I want to generate something C1 and here we can see that those entities they are in different nodes they could be on the same machine doesn't matter much for us uh, this is something that Calyx will take care for you to spread the entities but the abstraction that we need here is to have is the subscription that will allow us give us the guarantee that when something happens i will get notified and then i can move forward and uh, execute another action in the case here something happens in a1 i'm listening to that using the subscription and then i send a command to b1 b1 is now producing more events that i'm also listening to them and then I will react and send another command to C1. So there are different steps here, from entities to subscriptions to subscriptions back to entities. Let's see another more concrete example. I have here a shopping cart and the user added already two items and then it removed an item. So that's what I have in my journal, item added, item added and item removed. The content of the, the payload of those events are not important for our example here. So at some point, the user decides to check out the event, uh, the shopping cart. So a checkout event is emitted, and I have in my system a checkout subscriber that is listening to events from shopping cart and taking actions from that. And the, the user case here is whenever checkout is emitted, I want to create an order. So now I have one individual entity, shopping cart, that got checkout, and this event 
will trigger an action in my system under the hood. The subscriber will receive this checkout event, check, checked out event, and will create an order. Of course, here the order will also emit its own events, and I have another action here, another subscriber receiving events from other uh, entity and also execute some action. In the case here, whenever checkout is done, the checkout subscriber gets notified, it creates an order. Whenever an order is created, the other subscriber gets notified and it creates, initiates a payment. So as we can see here, there are three entities, but one action that happened in the shopping cart trigger cascaded a few uh, other commands down the road. So we start with checkout, we react to that, we create an order, we react to that, we start, we initiate a payment. But when we are working with subscriptions, it's important to understand how it works behind the scenes so you are prepared to understand what are the possible errors that we can uh, have when subscribing to events. So one, one important error is what we call a head of line error. In that case here, I have some events, event one, two, three, four, and five, doesn't matter much what is inside those events, they belong from an entity called a user entity, and uh, the letters uh, next to it is, are the identifiers. So I have three different instances here, and the events are all together in the, in the journal, and um, I'm subscribing to those events. So I have an action with a subscriber notation saying I want to receive events from a user entity. When you deploy that in production, Calyx, uh, so you define your action, you have your event handler which contains your business logic and um, you deploy that uh, into Calyx and what Calyx will do behind the scenes for you, it will start to read the journal and it will pick event one and will deliver to your event handler and when you finish processing this event, Calyx will save the offset. So as such that if something happens, if you restart that machine for some reason, if you redeploy it, it will start on the next event because event one was already processed. We save the offset, we save that event one has already been delivered to your event handler. But then this process keeps going. It keeps consuming the events and delivering to you the events in the order that they are found in the in the storage in the journal. But imagine that when Calyx tries to read event three, it fails to deserialize it. So we have the event persisted in storage, but for some reason you change the format, you change your code, and now what is in storage cannot be deserialized back to the type, to the model that you have in your uh, code. So now it fails. It fails to deserialize. This is a kind of problem that you can only solve by fixing your serialization, fixing, bringing back the type that you had before. Uh, if you need to do a, a, a migration of your format, you have to, to add it. And uh, because otherwise Calyx won't be able to read back this event, it will always fail. And when a subscription fails, it it crashes and then it waits a little bit and start over again. When it starts over again, it will go back to event three and, and then it will fail again. So you need to fix it. So if you have a serialization issue when reading events from your journal, you have to, to, to fix the serialization. In such a situation, you are kind of blocked here. Calyx won't be able to continue delivering events to your event handler because it's stuck on event three. So you have to fix it. Another kind of error that you also have to fix is when your event handler has some pro programming error that is just failing whenever it sees event three here. So Calyx picks the event from the journal, deserialize, okay, we succeed to deserialize it, we deliver that to your event handler, but then your event handler has a bug and it fails. Again here, this, this subscription is failing. It will keep failing and Calyx will keep trying to deliver this event tree to you and it will continue failing. So here again, you have to fix your code and redeploy. The third kind of error is when we read the, the event from the journal, we deserialize it, we deliver to your event handler. The event handler, you do your processing there, you return it and then Calyx needs to save the offset and for some reason, network issues or 
you just shut down the application at that moment, you undeploy it, everything, you remove all your nodes, something happens that Kelix are not able to persist that offset. When this process gets back to life, it will try to re-deliver event tree because for Kelix, this event was never delivered. We missed the chance to save the offset. So for us, it's like it never, it, it was never delivered so we deliver it, it again to your event handler and that's why when you are building subscriptions you have to make sure that your event handlers are idempotent whatever you do there inside you need to be protected and be sure that you that you can receive this event more than once and that you won't impact your data because of that that your data is protected is either potent. Um, so imagine that you're receiving the event and sending a command to some other entity. That entity must uh, be able to, to react and detect that this command was already sent. Now, in all those three cases, this, this case here, the first case and the second case, they are kind of blocking because it blocks your, your flow here. The subscriber cannot move forward until you fix your code. The third one, it's more intermittent uh, error. It happened, it, if it happens, it will just recover, but with the consequence that your event handler may see that event number three more than once. So this is an important aspect when you're building choreography sagas because subscriptions are an important part of choreography sagas. That's how we build choreography sagas. So, I have a, 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 a little demo to, so we can navigate a little bit through the codes and you can see um, it, it working uh, in, in, in a real application. And as a use case, I will uh, show you how you can solve one of the major challenges in event source applications and it's called the set-based consistency validation. And it's like that, you have let's say that we have a user entity that it's a uh, event source entity and in an event source system you don't have a table with columns user id name and email what you have is a journal with events so let's say that the user id here is the unique identifier for this entity and you have the name okay fine and you have the email address but you want the email address to be unique across all the user entities. You don't want two users using the same email address. So you, how can I build this uniqueness? How can I have this uniqueness constraint if what all that I have is a journal with events? I don't have a column email in a table where I can say here there is a constraint. This column needs to be unique. Uh, has a unique constraint. I cannot have that in an event sources system. And by the way, all the entities, they leave their own transactional boundaries. So I cannot go into create an entity and say, before create it, have a look on all the other entities in the system and check out if uh, any other user is using this email address. So it's not possible to do such a thing. So we need to do, uh, we need to think of our application in another way. We need to, to um, solve this problem using something quite different than what we usually would do with a relational database. So for this example, we're gonna use a choreographer saga. And how, what, what are the pieces that we're gonna have here? First, we're gonna have a user that will be an event sourced entity. Then I will have another entity, in that case will be a simple one, a value entity, that will be a kind of barrier for me. It will be just a unique mail the ID of this value entity will be the e email address. And I use that as a barrier to control the fact that if it's already used it or not. If it was already created, it's in Calyx, it's in the storage, I will detect that and I will be able to say, no, I cannot create this user because this email is already in use. Otherwise, if it was not yet created, I will be able to create a value entity for this email address and then I can move forward and create the user. And I will use two, I will have two actions with subscriptions subscribing to the events from the user entity and to the state change from the unique email value entity. And I also use a timer because in, there is a narrow condition, there is a narrow situation where I will, it's, it will be possible and we will simulate that, that we preserve an email, but we don't create the user. So now, because some error happens in the system, so now I reserved the email, that's one transaction, 
I need to create the user, but let's imagine that the user doesn't, uh, it's not created for some reason. Now I have a reserved email that I need to free. So I will use a timer for that. So let's first have a look here. We're gonna have an application controller that will get income request from the outside and to, a request to create a user. But before creating the user, it will try to reserve an email address. And for that, we're gonna have this unique email entity that we will first call it. And if it doesn't exist, we'll reserve it. We will create it for the first time and uh, we reserve it and then we create the user. Let's have a look at the code. So here is my application, application controller in which I receive a request to create a user. Here's the command. But before creating the user, I will send a command to this other entity, the unique email entity. I, I send this, this command, which is reserve email. That's the ID, email, and that's the user ID. Again, here I will use a Calyx client to talk to this entity. And the, the unique identifier for this entity is the email itself. So the, that gives us the guarantee that there is only one entity with this email address, one unique email entity. In my whole Calyx system, there is only one associated with this email address. It's the unique address of that. Let's have a look at the reserve method. So first, first let me scroll back here. So this is, my, this is my value entity. It's not an event sourced entity, it's like a key value entity, and it holds the state of a unique email. The unique mail has an address, the unique ID of this uh, email, the status, and eventually it will have an owner. The status can be not used, reserved, and confirmed. When I start, it has an address because it's the unique ID. It, it might not be in use. When I start it for the first time, it's not yet in use and therefore it does not have an owner. When I hit the reserve methods, I will check, okay, if it's already in use and it's already assigned to another owner, then I will emit this error. If it's assigned to another owner, okay, it means that this email was already created and it's assigned already to this owner, so I have nothing to do. But the last case is, okay, uh, I'm creating this, I'm making this reservation for the first time. So I will take the email here, I will update the state of my value entity, saying, okay, that's the address, it's reserved, that the state, and that's the user that is trying to reserve, that is trying to use this email. So it, this user here, this owner ID, is reserving this email address. Once that finish, I execute this call here, and then when it completes, I will go further and will create the user. And what I want to, to, to achieve here is, I first reserve the email, I create the user, and then I will have a subscription, listen to user events, and then it will see, okay, a user was created. There is an email that was assigned to this user. So now from my subscription, from my there are two choreography sagas here. The first one is this one that we are seeing now. So this small saga will say, oh, I saw that an email was assigned to this user. So it's time for me now to go to the unique email address and confirm it. Let's see the code. So here I have a user event subscriber. It's an action subscribing to events from user entity. And for the moment, we will look only to this method here. When, whenever an email assigned event is emitted by the user entity, this code will be called. And what we'll do here is say, okay, an email was assigned to this user. So let me hit now the value entity the e using this email and let's confirm it. Let's see what this method does. So here I'm back into the unique email entity and I call them, I will call this method confirm. And if it's reserved, no, so if it's still in that state, oops, 
if my email is on the state of the status of my email is reserved well it's time to confirm i just got the information that in my subscriber here i just got the information that this this email got assigned to a user so i can confirm it so here i changed the status of my email i saved the, the state and I'm, I'm done here here i change it to confirmed now if for some reason when this method is called my email is not confirmed it's not reserved it has some other state i just ignore it i just move forward because i don't want this method to fail remember at the potency that i was talking about whenever this event is delivered it, it might be delivered more than once to this method so either i confirm or i do nothing but i don't fail i don't let it fail now back to the slides this is the sunny day scenario everything worked as expected but of course life is not like that sometimes it will happen that you reserve the email address but you fail to create the user so what can we do here so for that we need to build another small saga that will make sure that this email gets unreserved so what we'll do here is we'll create yet another action that but this time this action will subscribe to unique email chains and whenever it sees that an email was created or is in status reserved it will schedule a time saying okay if it stays like that i will unreserve it let's have a look to the, at this code now so here is the the other subscriber i have yet again another action subscribing to value entity of this type here i won't get events but i will get this the full state of this value entity will be delivered to me so the first thing that i will do here is to create a timer id using the email the email is unique as we know and i'm just prefix it with timer just to make it easier to follow in the logs so if the email is in status reserved reserved here then i will schedule a timer look here i'm creating a call but i'm not calling that yet it's the third call in calyx i'm not executing this this is not being called it's lazy i create this call and i will ask calyx to create a timer now for me using the, this id using this delay and with this call so what will happen here for demo i put it on 10 seconds but you can put like five hours if you want you put, can put a very large number and uh, just to make sure that uh, this uh, email get unreserved far in the time in time you don't want to immediately unreserve it because you want your system to be able to 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 process the, the request so here what we are saying is we are telling calyx look uh, this is the timer id in 10 seconds please come and call this unreserved method let's have a look here in the unreserved method i will say okay if the state is reserved i will move it back to not use it the the empty state that i have if the state is confirmed of not in use i don't touch it i just return done because i don't want this method to fail either i'm at the reserve in reserved state and i want to bring it back to the initial state or i just move on here the empty state is just i erase the user there is no owner anymore and it's not to use it And that covers the situation where the user we fail to create the user so after some time the subscriber here the type the scheduler the timer that we scheduled will unreserve this email address so it can be used by another user now what we really want is to create the user and then we have the timer in one side and then sorry we created the unique mail and then we created the timer to eventually clean up but then we created the user and but when we create the user we will have the user event subscriber that will confirm the email address and when the email is confirmed 
the e unique email subscriber will also see this change. We'll see that an email was updated and now it's confirmed. So what it will do at that point, it can say, okay, I had a timer. I had a timer that I scheduled to unreserve this email, but it's already confirmed. So now I can remove the timer. So let's go back here. And uh, that's what the second here is when I schedule the timer and here is I, I receive yet another update of my unique email and say oh it's confirmed so okay good I can just now cancel the timer it's important to understand here that imagine that you don't do that imagine that you just return here like that I could eventually even comment out this part and say if it's reserved I create the timer if not I just ignore it and that will also work because what is going to happen here is imagine that you don't cancel the timer and then at some point because you register a timer before Calyx will run this timer and will call this method your email address is confirmed Calyx ca calls this method here and it will say ah it's not reserved it's confirmed so it will move to the else and say okay I have nothing to do your code is saying okay if you're confirmed I don't have anything to do I don't need to change the state of my 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 unique email address so you just move on and so the timer you can leave it there and it will fire and your system will still be in a correct state but it's of good practice to just uh, clean up timers that are doesn't are not necessary anymore so if it's obsolete timer just remove it because you are saving resources you are saving calls in your system and uh, all that has cost you know so it's better to just remove it uh, what else that i can show here let me see yeah that's that's the the flow we can see here that i have actually two subscriptions and they are not one i i can say here that we have two sagas two tiny sagas one between that makes sure that the interaction that data flows from user back to the unique mail entity to confirm it and there is another one based on a timer in which I listen to something and I take a decision okay I have an email that is reserved and uh, in a few minutes I will unreserve it and if it's already confirmed the unreserve will be um, ignore it and if it's, it's still reserved I will free that email address so let's go back to the calls and I want to run it to show uh, what happens uh, in this application I want to see, I want you to see um, the saga being executed in the background so the application is running the first thing that I want to, to check out is this call here I want to check what is the status of this email address so basically it's saying I, I hit this email address and ask it okay give me the status and it's saying okay it's not in use there is no owner not in use this email address is free so let's reserve let's let's create a user this one zero zero one John Doe living in Belgium and it will use this email address if I check here I can see that the saga didn't complete yet because this is this email address is on status reserved Let's go back to the our diagram here. And what happens here is that we are at that point here. No. Yeah, this one. We created the email address. I believe that at that point the email subscriber got already uh, the notification that a unique email address was created, was reserved, and it created a scheduler to unreserve it. And the user was created, but the ev user event subscriber when I did this call here, it, it didn't yet received the information that the user got an email assigned. So it didn't yet confirm my email address. So we are actually in this point in time. Of course, while I talk here, everything completed already. I can now check this one. And as we're going to see, it's confirmed. And if you check the logs, you'll see that the application controller got an email request to check it then I try to reserve the email address I hit the unique email entity to reserve it then I move forward to create the user ID the, the user I created the user here again it's me here interact with the controller 
the email subscribe received the information that an email was reserved and then it will schedule a timer to unreserve it but then in the meantime the user events subscriber received the information that an email was assigned to a new user so it goes back and hits the unique email entity and confirm that is in use further now the unique email subscribe receives the information that this email is confirmed meaning that it doesn't need the timer anymore so you say okay email is already confirmed and deleted the timer and the timer is deleted so the, that flow happens and we end up in this situation the email got confirmed we mark the unique email as confirmed and then we cancel the timer so the two sagas here are working in cooperation with each other now let's simulate an error i have this other email address here it's not in use i call it invalid acme.com not in use and i try to create an invalid user so here i'm using a random id and as you can see the payload is missing the name here i don't have the name if I do this call, if I execute this call, what we're gonna happen here is we first reserve this email address. But then when we try to create the user, it will fail because I'm missing the username. I have a condition here when I create my user that the name needs to be filled. I did that on propose so we can simulate an error. So if I go back here, and I try to create this user. Let's see what happens. Let's check. It's invalid, so it's reserved, sorry, for this random ID. And in the meantime, my, here is the error because I had a wrong payload for my user. In the meantime, the timer kicks in, kicked in. And now the email is re unreserved. Let's check again the status of the email and now it's back it's not to use it so what happened here is that uh, we, we got this situation I reserved the email address I failed to create the user and then th that other saga the unique email subscriber will unreserve it and I have here another user so we remember that this user was created its email is there it's confirmed so it's picked this email is confirmed to be in use by this user, user 001. Let me try to create another user using the same email address. And that will fail because if I go back to my controller, what happens here is that I try to create the second user, I try to re reserve the email, and this method here will fail because my this email is already in use. That's what we're gonna have here. It's in use and it's not for this user that I'm trying to create, so I return an error. And I search, this is this fails, and because this call fails, this this block here won't be executed. And I will move to the exception handling where I will emit a message, okay, this email is already reserved. Now there is another call here and I let let that for you to if you want to explore a little bit more how can I change an email address it's a similar situation here I'm trying to uh, modify user 001 by changing its email address and here is the same I will first need to reserve this email address and if it's confirmed and if I can reserve it I can move and change my entity and once I change my entity I need to unreserve the previous email address the John Doe uh, I, the previous one is do, do uh, at Acme and I want to move to this other one so I need to first reserve this I change the user and then I unreserve the previous email address so it can be used by someone else there is also a saga uh, uh, logic for that here in this project but I won't show I will leave it for you to, to explore and uh, so let's go back here a small recap of uh, choreograph sagas we built choreograph sagas by composing entities being that event source entities or key value entities we listen to events or to states changes 
using subscriptions and we let the data flow through our applications. One important characteristic of Sagas is that once it triggers it, it's a flow that propagates through your system like a wave of actions that and commands and events and subscriptions that got chained in each other and produce a final result. So it's something that runs in the background for you. You have to encode everything. Something happens, something triggers the first action and then the first command, let's say, that creates a wave of changes in your system. It's very important to make sure that each part, each interaction is uh, well tested and that you have uh, thought about all the possible error conditions because since it's a background process, you don't want it to keep fading in the background because when fa it, it starts to fade in the background, it will block your saga, but it also may block other sagas as well because the subscriptions, if you have a head of line errors, is not, uh, if you have a head of line error, it's not the that single uh, event that may be blocked, all the events that happen after this event will also be on hold because your subscription need, first needs to finish processing that event where it's stuck now. So head of line errors blocks everything and you have to be aware of that and make sure that you don't let them happen. Now, what are the drawbacks of choreographed sagas? I think it's already implicit in what I just said. There are two things here. They are hard to debug, background process. You don't have a to total visibility of what is happening there. You can have your tracing, you can have your logs, but you don't have a place where to go where you see, okay, my saga is at that point in time. And, and basically the fact that it's hard to track, it's what makes it uh, difficult to debug. So if you want to have more fine-grained control over, over uh, choreography of your sagas, then it's better to implement it using orchestration. And that's what we're going to see on the next webinar. In the next webinar, I will talk about uh, orchestration sagas, and I use exactly the same use case, but I will implement it using Calyx workflows, which allows you to build orchestration sagas. If you want to check out the source code and explore a little bit more, you can go to this QR, you can scan this QR code. It points to a GitHub page, a GitHub project where you have the source code. Okay, thanks for your time. We invite you to, to join our Slack channel. Uh, if you have more questions, you can reach out to us there. Otherwise, you can also scan that other um, QR code and uh, discover more about Calyx. Thank you very much.